If you give a plant-based meal with all whole foods, with the same amount of protein, versus a mixed meal with animal proteins, with exactly the same amount of energy and exactly the same amount of protein, the anabolic response to that meal with the omnivorous meal will be greater. People do not realize this muscle maintenance is an active process where you need both physical activity and nutritional stimuli to simply maintain your muscle. As soon as one of those two stimuli or both go away, like physical inactivity, disuse or food deprivation, you actually see muscle mass and muscle function. Why do we need protein at all? <laughs> that's uh, that's that's an overall uh, overarching question. Um, so uh, quite obviously all our tissues are in constant remodeling. So all of our tissues, the tissue proteins of which we are composed, is constantly being synthesized and broken down. Every tissue has a different turnover rate, but uh, most of your podcasts are either focusing on muscle. So muscle has a turnover rate of 1% to 2% per day. So that means that we break down muscle protein constant, continuously, and we synthesize it. And if you're in balance, you'll actually have a turnover rate of 1% to 2% per day. So in about 50 to 100 days, you have remodeled your skeletal muscle protein. And part of those amino acids that are released from the, following the breakdown of protein can be reused, but many of them can't. And so there is an inefficiency and also a good recycling efficiency. And so we need to regain or reprovide building blocks to sustain tissue integrity. There's a lot of conflicting advice out there over just how much protein we need to consume per day. What is your view on the baseline amount of protein an average adult would need? And then how does that change then if that person is active or engaging in resistance training, etc.? 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body mass per day because in general they will be between 1 and 1.2 grams per kilogram body mass per day. And for people that uh, are trying to optimize reconditioning to resistance type exercise or recovering from a, a period of disease or surgery, they are generally advised to little, be, a, be a little bit higher than those, those amounts. And then um, advice ranges from 1 to 2 to 1.6 grams of protein. Some will even go up to 2. I'm not sure whether that is relevant, but somewhere between 1.2 and 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram body mass per day. But it's not a necessity in order to sustain life and be healthy, but it can help you uh, at great, cre regain muscle faster or gain more muscle a little bit more on top of uh, a good training program. Would you agree with the, the sentiment of some of the experts I've had on this podcast who suggest that people in general aren't getting in enough protein to meet their basic needs? I think all the people... And people that are recovering from, recovering from a disease generally do not consume sufficient protein. I think people that are generally healthy and, and not sedentary will actually consume quite a lot of protein because automatically when you are more active, you are, will consume more food and automatically also consume more protein. And so most, most of us, like you and me, I mean, I'm not sure what your background is, but most of us will consume between 1 and 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram body mass per day. And that is certainly sufficient to, ma to maintain a healthy lifestyle. Um, that you can get a little bit more benefit uh, during recovery from surgery or training with a little bit more, that's fine. But to be honest, if I start exercising four hours a day, I will automatically consume more food and therefore also automatically consume a lot more protein. And then I automatically will already go to one. 1.3 or 1.4, even 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram body mass per day. So it's also a matter of calories and how much you can chew. Body fat and weight loss are always a hot topic. And if someone is looking to lose fat, do they need to adjust their protein intake at the same time? So in general, when we um, try to lose weight by uh, following a hypocaloric diet, so basically consuming less calories than your body needs, so that you need you will also lose fat-free mass, which part of that is also uh, muscle mass. And of course, you want to prevent that from the light of a healthy body composition. And if you maintain habitual protein intake, you will actually have less muscle loss than when you reduce protein intake. 
So I'm not so sure whether increasing protein intake is that more, more beneficial. I think the level of physical activity is much more relevant. But I always advise people not to consume less protein when they're on a hypercaloric diet. So that means you're eating less calories, but you're maintaining the absolute amount of protein, which will automatically transduce into eating a more protein-dense diet. Because if you're consuming the same amount of protein at a lower energy intake, it automatically means you have to eat more protein dense. And that is automatically also what happens in the hospital when people start fortifying the foods with proteins or having oral nutritional supplements with a high protein content. That will attenuate or that will uh, result in less accelerated muscle loss during hypercaloric diet. But the most important thing is when you're on a hypercaloric diet, do some resistance exercise two to three times a week. So that will actually prevent you from a lot of the muscle mass loss. I spoke with Dr. Don Lehman, who you'll know uh, on this podcast a few months ago, and he was the person who initially suggested we ingest uh, 30 grams of protein per meal and space our protein intake throughout the day. Since he established that particular sentiment uh, a few years ago. He said he's changed his philosophy on that. And he says he's not as disciplined about uh, that that take as such. So it, it doesn't really matter when you consume protein, as long as you consume protein throughout the course of the day. What is your view on timing of protein consumption? So from the doses response studies, it has been shown that uh, ingestion of about 20 grams of protein will maximize muscle protein synthesis for up to about uh, four to six hours after food intake. Now, uh, that study has been reproduced about two to three times, uh, all showing that 20 grams is sufficient to maximize muscle protein synthesis for a couple of hours. Now, obviously, um, it all, I mean, most of our research, most of the researchers, unfortunately, still want to work office hours. So they were, they want to work for eight or maybe nine or 10 hours, but uh, these studies take a lot of time. So if you do a stabilized top tracer study where you take muscle biopsies after ingesting of a certain amount of protein, it also includes a baseline period of up to three hours. Then you have to put catheters in people. So in general, a study looking at the acute response to a bonus of protein will easily take you about nine to 10 hours. So people restrict that time of about four to five hours after food ingestion, which also covers the normal time between two meals. So those studies have shown that 20 grams covers a maximal response over a few hours. Now, of course, this is just in the matter of thinking of one meal towards the other meal. Uh, we have not too long ago, we performed a study with 100 grams of protein which, of course, on the internet is now displayed as a gap in just huge amount of protein, which is completely lost in nuance. We did a proof of principle study providing 100 grams versus 25 grams of protein. And because we used intrinsically labeled protein, and now we can, we can get into that later, but it's a way that we can assess digestion, absorption, release of the circulation, and incorporation into muscle protein over an extensive period of time. And when we provided 100 grams, we saw a continuous increase in muscle protein synthesis over a much more prolonged period of time, up to 12 hours. So if you measure long enough, you will get a greater response with more protein because it takes time to digest, absorb, release, and stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So it's certainly not the case that one bolus of protein is the maximum and that everything above that is being oxidized or neglected. That's not how the body operates. But if you think of most of us consuming three days, a, a three meals a day, it makes sense to think of meals. And then if you want to achieve your optimal amount of protein, you think of a bonus of protein breakfast, a bonus of protein with lunch, and a bonus of protein uh, in your dinner. And particularly, probably also some protein rich snacks in between. But it does, it's not the case that with a larger amount of protein, you cannot extend that anabolic response over a more prolonged period of time. It's, it's more practical to advise people to consume enough protein with each meal than to tell people to consume 100 grams of protein in a single meal. And that in that context, then, if we're looking at people who are training, uh, the advice historically has been to consume protein within a, a certain window, either before or after training. What is your take on this? Uh, so, I mean, when people talk about uh, should I ingest my protein before or after the exercise session, 
30 minutes or how fast should I do it? Should I run from the gym to my gym back and take the protein shake? Of course, everything is much more nuanced than that. But the first important thing is what you have to understand is that protein stimulates muscle protein synthesis and physical activity stimulates muscle protein synthesis. When you combine these two main anabolic stimuli, you see some synergy. When you're physically active and you ingest protein after that physical activity, you see a greater increase in muscle protein synthesis with more of the ingested protein to be used for muscle protein synthesis. So there's also an efficiency effect. Physical activity makes you more sensitive to the stimulating effect of protein ingestion. That happens, or that effect, can actually last for up to 24 and maybe even 48 hours. So if you perform exercise today, your response to breakfast tomorrow morning will still be greater than if you would not have performed exercise. So that already tells you that the timeline of that protein intake is less relevant because with one training session, all four or five meals afterwards will be greater, the response will be greater, uh, before you actually have your next session. So whether it's protein before or after the training session, it's the con continuum of consistent training sessions with meals in between so that every meal has a greater effect due to the exercise that is performed in between all those meals. Great to get your clarification on that, because as you say, you do see many people who do run to their gym bags uh, to dose up on protein powders, etc. after their training session. Speaking of which, anybody who goes to a supplement store will see shelves lined uh, with all forms of uh, protein supplements, be they casein, uh, whey protein isolate, whey protein concentrate. What are the What's the difference between these kinds of protein supplements and, uh, and really do they make a difference? So, so first of all, uh, the protein supplements should be regarded as a, as a um, practical food or practical supplement. It's, it's, it's just a nutrient that you also get from your normal nutrition. But the same way that we inge ingest, for example, a carbohydrate-rich sports drink on the bike because we want to supply ourselves with additional carbohydrates if we have not enough stores in our body, and then we ingest that drink during, during cycling. Now, you can also eat a, a, a plate of pasta on the bike, but then you can't actually have both your hands on the steering wheel and you might actually drop off your bike. So it's a convenience boot. It's a convenience, a convenient way to supply the body with the nutrients it needs in a certain time point or time, the time course or condition. And it's the same thing for protein. For example, if you ingest some protein after a training session in the evening, because otherwise you wouldn't consume your main meal because you had your main meal say at five or six you go out to the gym at nine o'clock in the evening you come back at 10 it might be smart to have a certain amount of protein in order to, to help stimulate muscle protein synthesis and we've already shown that if you actually do that it will actually have no effect on the response on breakfast the next morning so there seems to be at least somewhat of a um window of opportunity to maximize the anabolic response to, to exercise. Now, could that be a, a protein drink? Could that be a protein bar? Could that be a meal? Everything would actually work. But it's also a matter of just timing your meals well, because instead of your protein bar or your meal or your protein shake, you can also have a sandwich or some yogurt with fruit or your meal that is timed at 9 o'clock instead of 6 o'clock. All of these options are there. Now, if we're going to look at the very small differences in the impact of different proteins on stimulating or helping to stimulate muscle protein synthesis, these things are, to my extent, more academic in nature. But if you want and you're interested in that, and I also said it in a podcast here, a Dutch podcast not too long ago, I probably, my bike, my race bike, generally is probably about eight and a half kilos. I probably have 15 kilograms of overweightness. So why do I have such an, such an expensive bike? Because I can better just lose a few kilograms would actually just improve my performance better. But I want a good bike and other people want the best protein. But differences are small. From an academic point of view, the protein, that the, the, the protein characteristics that define the, stimulant, the capacity to stimulate muscle protein synthesis is rate of digestion and absorption 
and amino acid composition. Now, most of the data that we have comes from milk protein and especially the separation between whey protein, which is 20% of milk protein, and casein, which is 80% of milk protein. Casein, micellar casein, is a slowly digestible protein. So you have a slow increase in circulating amino acids in the circulation that doesn't stimulate muscle protein synthesis as much as a rapid increase in circulating amino acids. However, um, you also have differences in amino acid composition, where, for example, casein has a low whey, where a low leucine content, whey protein has a high leucine content, and the amino acid leucine is one of the amino acids that has very strong anabolic signaling properties. So we believe, in general, that it's important to have a rapid increase in circulating essential amino acids, of which leucine is the most important one, and also a sustained provision of amino acids. Now, the nice thing, in general, you see the whey protein is more rapidly digested and absorbed, more of the amino acids are released in the circulation, leading to higher essential amino acids and higher leucine concentrations, and therefore stimulating muscle protein synthesis to a greater extent than a slowly digestible casein protein with a low leucine content. And this has been uh, validated in various studies over, say, zero to three, four, five hours. However, differences become much smaller when we look over a more prolonged period of time, because we see that, for example, where whey actually gives a rapid response, it's the casein that gives a greater response if we take a longer period of time. Same thing goes for branched-chain amino acids. We've ingested branched-chain amino acids to see a massive increase in muscle protein synthesis for two hours, but the next three hours, there's a low protein synthesis. And if we give exactly the same branch chain amino acids in the form of milk protein, this response is continued over a more prolonged period of time. So it all depends on provision of amino acids, as well as the stimulation of muscle protein synthesis with essential amino acids and leucine concentrations in the blood. So yes, those differences, but they're very academic. And if you actually see them in the light of a mixed meal or after exercise, differences become much more. I see too many people consuming protein supplements, but when I ask them how much protein they consume in their normal diet, they can't tell me. They know exactly how many grams of protein powders they're consuming, but if I ask them how much protein they're consuming in their diet, they can't tell me. So then the usefulness of a supplement is a bit weird because a supplement is on top of something. So you should know what you're consuming and they then say, I need an additional supplement on top of that. And then you can just decide to do that with a product that is more protein dense, so healthy foods, or a protein supplement that is uh, composed of pure protein, like a protein powder or something like that. Now, if your rest of your diet is fine, then both options are fine. Now, this is a contentious issue. No doubt you've been asked this many times in the past, but I'd love to hear your views. Which is better a source of protein, animal or plants? So... Before uh, people start, uh, because everybody has an opinion, because everybody eats, so everybody's an expert. I think that, at least I talk, I talk for the Western world, in the Western world, would have, most people would be healthier if they consume a more plant-based diet. Because when you consume a more plant-based diet, and then I'm referring to plant-based diet as uh, in, the, in, the, in the sense of whole foods, then you're consuming more plants, more vegetables, more fruits, and one of the main things that will happen is you will consume less energy. If you consume less energy, you'll get less overweight, you'll get less obese, and you'll be more healthy. So a plant-based diet will help you to uh, consume less calories and still be full. That's one of the main things why a more plant-based diet is beneficial. Now, if we go to the efficacy of plant-based foods or animal-based foods on their capacity to stimulate muscle protein synthesis, that's a different story. If you ingest plant-based foods, they generally contain less protein per, per gram, per volume, or per caloric content. If you want to ingest 20 grams of protein, you can consume 70 grams of a steak or of a good quality meat source, or you can consume more than a kilogram of potatoes, if that makes sense. 
So it's much more difficult to get the same amount of protein in through plant-based whole foods in general. Now, and then there's a second part of it, is that the, the, avail the bioavailability of protein from plant-based foods is less convenient. Our body is less effective, less efficient in extracting the protein from plant-based sources. So that is also uh, an issue. So if you give a plant-based meal with all whole foods, with the same amount of protein, versus a mixed meal with animal proteins, uh, with exactly the same amount of energy and exactly the same amount of protein, the anabolic response to that meal uh, with the omnivorous meal will be greater. Now, of course, the main question is about plant-based powders because most questions come from athletes asking me about powders, protein isolates or concentrates. Now, look, again, if we look at... And uh, the, the literature, most of the studies show that if you give plant-based powders, plant-based protein, isolates or concentrates, that the same amount of plant-based protein derivative or the isolate the concentrate will have less of a capacity to stimulate muscle protein synthesis when compared to a high quality animal derived protein source, such as egg protein or milk protein, whey or casein protein. Now that is probably not the case, not due to a reduced digestibility, because when you have a protein powder, the digestibility issues with plant-based whole foods is basically solved. It's also nearly 100%. But then it's probably the amino acid composition. We know that most plant-based proteins have less essential amino acids, and they're often deficient in one or more specific amino acids, which is often lysine and methionine. Now, is that the reason why, at least in some people, uh, older people, and in smaller amounts of protein, we see a lesser anabolic response when we provide the same amount of plant-derived protein versus animal-derived protein? Can you overcome this? Yes. If you give 30 grams of a plant-based protein, even if it's a well-balanced or an unbalanced protein, we no longer see differences between uh, anabolic responses in young people following digestion of 30 grams of an animal-derived protein, a milk-derived protein, or a plant-derived protein. So, in short, and this is a very long explanation for something that has actually no rocket science, you can compensate for lesser quality by greater quantity. And so this is also, I mean, a lot of the, your, your, your listeners will probably have seen that documentary, um, the, the game changers and stuff like that, where they're all saying like, hey, plant-based proteins are fantastic. Of course, plant-based proteins can be uh, a fine uh, uh, nutrient or the source of, of protein to stimulate muscle gain performance and everything. Because athletes, vegan athletes or vegetarian athletes will actually consume a lot of foods because they're active. So they will consume well in excess of that one gram of protein per kilogram body mass per day. So they are automatically have already compensated lesser quality by greater quantity. So it's not an issue there. If you actually get 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram body mass per day, I don't really care too much about the quality anymore because it's a lot of protein and it doesn't come from one source. It comes from one protein that has a deficiency in this one one protein that is deficiency in another amino acid. So the total diet is probably not unbalanced. So in short, if you actually do what your mom says, eat enough food, uh, keep it variable, you're fine. You're, you're, you're going to get enough proteins. And so for athletes or active people, it's not an issue. But what I am worried about is that nowadays, everything has to be plant-based. And even in our hospital, we're getting questions like, should all the nutrition for the patients be plant-based? And that is something that I'm actually a little bit uh, hesitant because if you are um, clinically compromised, you can't eat a lot, you want the highest quality because you can't compensate for the quality by greater quantity because these patients cannot consume enough food. They can't consume enough energy. They can't consume enough protein. So we certainly don't want to give them plant-based whole foods where they can't extract the protein and also the quality is less. So the people have to understand the nuance. And that's always difficult when you start the discussion over plant versus animal-based proteins. 
you don't want to see the emails that I get. If we publish something on plant-based proteins, I get comments. And if we publish something on animal-based proteins, we get comments too. And it's it's a lot of it all. <laughs> oh, I can very much relate to that because anytime I broach either subject, it's a similar thing in respect of uh, comments from the audience uh, and myself. So I, I can completely relate to it. And just uh, moving quickly to collagen. Collagen is something that you can supplement with also. What are your thoughts on the efficacy of uh, supplementation with collagen? Yeah, so um, we've done quite a lot of studies now and there's still a few studies to come. Uh, the idea is interesting, of course. Collagen is uh, from an amino acid composition, a very cool quality protein. That's basically what they what they, what they would say based on the fact that it has a lot of uh, glycine and proline. Nearly 40 to 50 percent of all the amino acids is glycine and proline, which of course, from a balanced perspective of, for example, an egg protein, is much more on the non-essential amino acids. So, so where um, uh, um, high quality uh, animal derived protein is about 50, more than 50 percent essential amino acids, the collagen is actually, uh, is also animal based, of course, but uh, has a high non-essential amino acid content because nearly 50% of all the amino acids is glycine and proline. However, why do we think it might be a benefit or why, why, why it might actually help you with, and you often see the advertisements on skin health or bone health or whatever, is that all our connective tissue in our body, cartilage, bone, tendons, ligaments, is a lot of collagen based and collagen as i said same as the collagen in your body contains a lot of glycine and proline so the suggestion is that if you consume collagen you get a lot of the glycine and proline which are also the building blocks of the collagen in your body so the suggestion is that if you submit it or supplement it you get more glycine and proline which can help you build uh, more of your connective tissue in your, in your body but now the big question is does supplement, supplementing it help? In other words, does your habitual foods, do, does, does that not contain sufficient glycine and proline to optimize connective tissue health in your body? Now, that is a, that is a discussion that is certainly not solved. Uh, what we have been doing is to see whether collagen ingestion after exercise can further stimulate the synthesis of connective tissue in your muscle. And we didn't see an increase we see that the glycine and protein that you ingest is actually used as a building block for your structural connection, your stru structural tissue in your muscle, but it's not further stimulating tissue protein synthesis. Like, for example, uh, your, 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 your whey protein actually does. It actually stimulates uh, muscle protein synthesis overall, but collagen does not. But when you perform exercise, we see that collagen synthesis in the muscle comes up. So we don't see the greater benefit of collagen supplementation on directly stimulating muscle protein synthesis. The only question that I think is still out there is, is the body in need for more glycine and proline than you normally consume in your regular diet when you're doing hard training or when you're recovering from surgery? That is a still a question that is out there, but in general, same as with the other issue, if you consume enough protein and enough foods, I think there's enough glycine and protein available, and that additional collagen is not going to have a huge effect. Really interesting. Thank you for answering that. Um, one a final one before I let you go, doctor. I had a great conversation with her neurologist about brain health uh, last week or the week before, and she said that the brain craves change. It wants to be stimulated, and it wants to be given the opportunity to adapt and I was just thinking while you're talking, muscles are the same really, aren't they? They need, they need to be uh, stimulated in order to adapt, in order to grow. Yes, and then they also, I mean, it's even, wor it's even worse. They need to be stimulated to maintain. So muscle maintenance, and people do not realize this, muscle maintenance is an active process where you need both physical activity and nutritional stimuli to simply maintain your muscle. And people don't realize that until they've actually had an arm or a leg and a cast, or whether they've actually been submitted to the hospital for a week for a new hip or new knee, or whether they actually, uh, I hope not, whether they actually spent some time in the intensive care unit. As soon as one of those two stimuli or both go away, like physical inactivity, disuse, or food deprivation, 
you actually see muscle mass and muscle function go down very rapidly. So not only for muscle gain you need those stimuli, but also for muscle maintenance. Really interesting discussion and an important one. Thank you so much sir, for your knowledge today and sharing your experience on protein synthesis and on muscle building and maintenance. Uh, Dr. Luke Van Loon, thank you for your time. You're welcome. If you enjoyed that video, I know you'll get some value from this video right here.